and British English is more fluid in there's not as big an emphasis on things like handbooks like there are in um, American English. So let's talk about some other kinds of differences. These are, you know, point seven, miscellaneous differences. What do we mean by that? <clears throat> Louder? Authority. Authority, okay. Functional shifts. Such as shifting the words part of speech, making a verb a noun, vice versa, and also back formation. So give me an example of making a verb into a noun or a noun into a verb. Yeah. Googling. Okay. Google's what? Obviously. A noun. It's a noun. Okay. What else? Give me an older one. Right. This one's dead. Um, that's, that's real modern. I mean, that's just in the last 10 years. I'm thinking of one that you probably don't think of as a functional shift because you were born using this. That's a noun. Originally, that's a noun. It was changed in American English to a verb. A contact is something that touches something else. In electrical terms, it's when you have one electrical wire, possibly, connect to another one so that a circuit goes through. It's been altered. It's been functionally shifted to a verb to contact. So that people will say, let me contact you. Well, if you take that by its original meaning, what's it mean? Let me touch you. Yeah, I mean, which can get all weird, right? Okay. Well, it's still a noun in a business world. They call a prospect or a business. A contact. Exactly. So you're going to contact a contact. Notice how that can, you know, make things a little, um, a little odd, okay? So that's an example of a functional shift. A back formation. Taking a word and making something else from it. Now, the one I've given up, okay, the verb to burgle from the noun burglar. Okay, the noun has existed for a long time. The verb never did. So that's called a back formation because you already have the noun. Okay, somebody who does something. Well, what does that imply within it? That action, right? It implies the action of the verb. See, this, without this, this doesn't necessarily imply the action. So, what else can you, can you think of a possible, just on the fly, a back formation from another noun that you are aware of that has that kind of er ending? People have actually done this. You can actually see this in some writing. What's a butler do? Some have said that a butler buttles to buttle. Just what's the meaning of to buttle? To do what a butler does, to be a butler, okay? So that's how we know that's a back formation. Notice, to teach, obviously, is not a back formation from a teacher. Those are two different, totally different kind of things. But this is something that Americans tend to do. We seemingly are a little bit, in, in this aspect at least, we kind of go back to our Renaissance foundations. Right? Because when was the United States founded? Not the country colonies 1607 right Jamestown and then Plymouth 1620 that's right during the middle of the Renaissance well kind of toward the end of the Renaissance but it's before the 18th century and all that emphasis on rules and ascertainment and everything what's the the word that we described the Renaissance in enrichment building up lack of rules fluidity etc okay so you're going to see some of this. What else? American um, English use of compounding. 
hard drive interface, backcountry, bushwhack. But I mean, just notice those first two. Those are words from what? Technology. Why, why did those come from the United States? Because we were the pushers, you know, like drug pushers. We were the pushers of technology in the 20th century. We were the drivers of technology, the innovators of technology. Keyboard, you know, all those terms, okay? What else? American use of affixes. The I's, endings. What industry does that come out of? Colorize, martinize, deputize. Where do you see that kind of thing more than anywhere else? Advertising. That's Madison Avenue speak, okay? Where you add that kind of adjectival ending on something so that anything can become what? Descriptive, okay? Because what is what's the whole purpose of advertisements? To describe for what purpose? To entice, to sell, right? Okay? Hyperbole. Humongous. Humongous. Stupendous. Totally awesome or totally, you know, rad. Those are all Americanisms. Right? And I've got more, I think, somewhere written down. Yeah, rambunctious is an Americanism. Discombobulate is an Americanism. Bamboozle. Those are all Americanisms, okay? Um, examples of hyperbole. Okay, growth of national consciousness. Um, Yeah, let me give you a couple more more examples of um, functional shifts. Okay, so I've already done contact. Two Lynch. Okay, what else? Deed, like a piece of paper that says you own a piece of property, becomes. To deed, so you deed over a property to somebody, turning it from a noun to a verb. Service, to service, like to service a car, right? Host, person who throws a party, to, to host, okay? Party, a gathering of people, to party, that's an American functional shift. Back formations. To edit, editor, enthusiasm, enthuse. Enthusiasm is the noun. To enthuse, to enthuse somebody. That's not one that you hear much. Burglar and burglar, we have um, already talked about, etc. Okay, now go on to um, growth of nat national consciousness. This is this is kind of interesting. Okay. Um, Jefferson, um, Jefferson proposed finding another word to describe American English. That is another word for the language, not English. He didn't say American. Let's speak American. But he, he suggested, for what purpose? Make that break complete. Totally separate from um, why? Because of the dominance of British standards in language and culture. I mean, all the colonists were British, right? The vast majority. Yeah, I know there were some Hessians and some Prussians. There were a few French, right? Early on, at, at least. Okay? So, the term Americanism, first used by John Witherspoon, President of Princeton, member of the Continental Congress, signer of the Declaration, when? 1781. Okay? 
Pickering did a dictionary of Americanisms. Notice the title of that thing. A vocabulary or collection of words and phrases which have been supposed to be peculiar to the United States of America. To which is prefixed an essay on the present state of the English language in the United States. That's the title. Put that on the work site. You know? um, and the phrases are phrases which are to be abolished from the language. Okay? Cooper emphasized making an American literature and culture. Just read Cooper's Leather Stocking Tales, the, the Natty Bumpo's Tales. If you've never read any of them, read The Deerslayer. Okay? It's one of the earliest American novels, in which what Cooper is doing throughout those novels is he's kind of creating a national awareness or consciousness, as opposed to the French, the British, etc. Okay? Spelling reform and proposal for an academy. Where have we heard that idea before? 18th century. We saw it with the French. They actually set up an academy. We saw it with the Italians. They set up an academy. They both fail in terms of what their goal is. Several English writers propose academies. England never actually goes about to set one up, okay? So you have proposals, but it's never done. So Ben Franklin advocates spelling reform, and there's discussion in your book about that. John Adams advocates academy to preserve the purity of the language. Notice what Adams is doing there. He's That's that 18th century mindset. Let's freeze it. Let's stop it from changing, and let's purify it. Right? And then we get Noah Webster. Look at Webster's dates. He's born in what year? 1755. Why is that year important? What else happens in that year? That's the year Samuel Johnson publishes his dictionary. Right? Yeah, that'll probably be on the exam at some point. <clears throat> so, why is Webster important? Because every one of you has a dictionary that is probably titled Merriam-Webster's okay, or Random House, which is based on the Merriam-Webster's. The Merriam part we might talk about, Merriam merely bought the copyright. Merriam didn't do anything. Bought the copyright, got to put the name on it. Okay? So why is Webster important? Well, he's got notice four major books, so to speak. Okay. The first one, Grammatical Institute of the English Language. Sounds pretty dull and boring, right? Published in three parts. The American Spelling Book, 1783, which is the most important part. A grammar and a reader. Okay. So you get the spelling book first, then the grammar, then the reader. Not First, one year, another year, another year, etc. Okay? Then he publishes dissertations on the English language. This isn't dissertations like, oh, this is my PhD dissertation. This just means really long papers okay, on the English language. This is his theoretical construct behind the Grammatical Institute. But it comes after. Okay? Then you get the compendious dictionary of the English language. So, the spelling book comes first, actually. Dictionary comes later. And then you get the American Dictionary of 1828, which is a revision of the compendious dictionary. What's the word compendious mean? Has a lot of words. Johnson's dictionary had about 55,000 words. Webster's has 70,000. So, Webster's kind of out johnson -y Johnson with his dictionary. And notice, he does that just about 50 years after Johnson. And he does it by himself, like Johnson did. He has, you know, some scribal secretary help that kind of thing. Okay? So, the Blueback Speller, the first thing, the American Spelling Book, why is it called the Blueback Speller? This book is all about that speller. And notice, 
it's got a blue back because his book had a blue binding. It was common nickname was just the blue back speller, right? On American spelling and pronunciation. It's first published in 1783. It goes through tens, excuse me, scores of editions from 1783 to 1900. So that by 1900, over 100 million copies of this are in use. 100 million. Here's, here's some, give you an example of the data just on this one book. So I'll skip to 1703, uh, 1783, and go up to 1805. So in 1805, 95,450 copies were printed. 1806, 150,000. Next year, 212. Next year, 213. So from 1805 to 1818, you have over three and a quarter million copies. Now, I don't remember. You, one of you could Google it real quickly. What the American population is in 1818, it's not a whole lot more than three and a quarter million. Right. So why are there so many copies? Of this? this is being used everywhere. This is the standard, quote unquote, teaching spelling book used in American schools. Now, American schools in 1818 aren't like American schools today. They're not nearly as large. There aren't nearly as many. But Ben Franklin did start the first public school, etc. So you do have public schools and such. But notice, each year, it's like almost each year, they go up and up and up and up. You have a couple drops here, but then it goes back up. Huge jump, drop down, huge jump, drop down, you know, okay. Little bit, okay. So why, why the need for this? Well, Webster, like reformers before him, like those 18th century grammarians and such before him, and academy proposers before him, thought the language is changing. The language is changing too much. We need to stop the change, okay. So, what's he emphasize? Okay. The American Dictionary of 1828. Notice, two large volumes, 70,000 words. And what does he do? He takes Johnson's model and he kind of extrapolates. He does the same thing Johnson does, but adds to it. How does he add to it? He adds pronunciation guides. He adds, what do I want to call this? Stress guides or accent guides. Guides. He divides words into syllables. Okay? Nobody had done that before. So in doing that, what is he doing? He's telling us how to pronounce the words. <laughs> On the basis of what? What's his standard? What's he appealing to? No, he doesn't have anything. It's his understanding, his belief of how it ought to be performed, how it ought to be pronounced and such. It's, it's Webster that makes those spelling changes that differentiate between American and British English. Okay? So, and I'm going to put up some stuff in just a minute. <clears throat> Here's what he says in his dissertations. As an independent nation, our honor, honor, requires us to have a system of our own. Okay, remember, dissertation 1789. Separate nation now, okay, requires us to have a system of our own in language as well as government. See, that I think is where Webster makes a faux pas. He, he creates a false dichotomy. Yes, governmental difference, language, it's the same language. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to say, yeah, but we're Americans. We're going to speak American. So, Great Britain, whose children we are, 
and whose language we speak should no longer be our standard. What does that mean? We should no longer look to Great Britain's writers? To some extent, yes. But he says, we shouldn't pattern the way we speak after the British. It's almost like he's saying, because we've broken off politically from them, let's really change the way we speak our language. So, for the taste of her writers is already corrupted. He's writing this in 1789. Who's he talking about? All the great writers of the 18th century. Congreve, Dryden, Johnson, Addison, Steele. If you go back and read those writers today, hopefully, you would say, wow, these are great stylists of the English language. Not corrupt, right? So, and her language on the decline. So if it's on the decline, then what does that mean? Somewhere back there in the golden mists of time, there's what? There's the perfect form. Well, what did Mulcaster say? The English of our day will be seen as the golden age. And for some, Elizabethan English is the greatest period of the English language. It's when it, it's when it reaches its height and then it starts to you know, fall off after that. But if it were not so, that is, if, if what I've just said isn't true, here's what he's really emphasizing. She is at too great a distance to be our model. Now, imagine for a moment, Webster's not writing in 1789, but he's writing in 2019. If she's too great a distance to be our model and to instruct us in the principles of our language, but it's 2019, and distance means what now? Yeah. <laughs> you pull up this thing and you're speaking with somebody in England or your phone, immediately. Distance, he says, implies difference. Today, it doesn't. Okay? So, a couple other things about Webster. Um, as I said, it's Webster that gives us, see, that's the no good marker. Where did I put it's Webster that tells us to do things like this. To divide that syllable there, or divide that word into those two syllables. Prior, I am assuming, you could say, cluster, cluster. What else? Um, let's see here. Which is that? <clears throat> In the spelling book of 1783, okay, I mentioned, you know, he, he doesn't have a real standard that he can appeal to. He can't say look to. So where does Webster live? New England. So what dialect is he familiar with? New England, New England dialect. Okay. So his, new, his pronunciation guide is very much based upon New English, um, the New England dialect. Okay. And he comes up with a way of writing pronunciation. Let me give you an example. I'm going to give you two different examples. I'm going to give you one from this, which was the notes I had when I took this course. And the copy that's in here is not very well preserved. Hopefully it'll work. Okay, so this, this is a photocopy from the Blue Book, the Blueback Speller. Let me shrink that down just a little bit. <coughs> So, an easy standard of pronunciation. Notice you've got kind of one table at the top. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different tables. Okay? 
Each one is to indicate a different pronunciation of a vowel. So one and two are both dealing with the pronunciation of that letter. Okay? So one long, two is short. So he says, look under the one here and notice what you see in lines down beneath it. Okay? Or excuse me, you got the, the long vowels and then the short vowels. So you have A, couple of different spellings, name, late, E or double E, here, feet, right? So two different spellings with the same sound. Letter I, time, fine, O, note, fort, U or spelled E-U, excuse me, E-W, tune or tuna, I think it's tuna and new, and then Y, okay? So then you have the short form. Then you have broad or, broad A or aw, A-W, okay? Ald, tall, cost, sought. Same pronunciation, cost, sought. Some people will say cost, sought, aw, 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 okay? Um, Law, flat A. This is what the Brits think of as the American A. Ask. Okay? Part. Ask. Part. Ask. Part. Those are two different sounds, right? Okay? So, he then has an explanation down here. A figure stands as the invariable representative of a certain sound. That is, this represents a sound. Right? Figure one represents the long sound of the letters. Two, the short sound. Three, marks the sound of broad aw uh, as in hall. Four, represents the sound of aw uh, as in father. I don't know, in your ears, do you hear a difference between the aw uh, in hall and the aw uh, in father? I don't. But some of you do, right? I'm just being heads through this, or you might be sleeping. Uh, five, short sound of broad, uh, as in not, and what? Not, what? Uh, uh. Not the same sound, but it was for Webster, right? So this for him is what? Walk, not, right? Various other things. So, next page, he gives us another thing of pronunciation. So I'm going to pull Well, why won't? Because I lost it. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, he goes on because you couldn't see them very well. So you've got, you know, the other examples there of the different sounds, okay? How easy is that to learn? Why? It's not intuitive, it's also not what? Unless you're native New English dialect speaker. It's not natural. So what's he trying to do to American? He's trying, to the same. trying to make it all sound the same. Okay? So, um, let's see here, what else? Hold on a second. In the Blueback Speller, he uses stories as examples, okay? That is, he gives stories as part of the reader and such. Um, lost my place in these notes. Let me finish this before we go into dialectology. Yeah, a couple other things. In the etymologies of the dictionaries, of the dictionary, the big dictionary, uh, of 1828, 
Some of the etymologies he takes back to Hebrew for English words, English words that are Hebrew oriented. Okay, he uses a lot of biblical stories um, as examples. That is in English, obviously. Okay, and he talks about the story of Tower of Babel. Now we haven't talked about it very much. I think we did maybe at the beginning, first or second day of class. But in the in the Renaissance, and to some extent later, it was thought the original language was Hebrew. That is, Adam and Eve spoke Hebrew. Why? Because they're obviously Jews. God spoke Hebrew, in other words. He doesn't speak God, he speaks Hebrew. So Right? The problem with that is manifold, right? I mean, what's a very, very basic one if you have a very, very basic understanding of biblical stories? Well, the Tower of Babel. <laughs> they would no longer speak Hebrew then, today. Okay? Because whatever the original language was, you know, got shattered into Semitic, into the European, Dravidian, Australian, all those other languages and such. Okay? Um, so, I mean, Webster isn't what we would call a philologist like Grimm was. Okay? He wasn't trained in it like Grimm, so to speak, was. Okay, so let's leave Webster aside, and we'll talk, not real long, but a little bit about dialectology. We touched on it the other day, and I'm going to put a couple of um, charts up in a moment, just of the Deep South for a couple of words to give you an idea of what isoglosses and such, okay? And you can go to this website if you get interested in dialectology um, and read all about it, okay? So, relative homogeneity of American English. What does that mean? If something's homogeneous, what, is it, what does it mean? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty much the same. Even though, take somebody from South Georgia and put them in Boston, you know, there's a bit of difference. But that ain't nothing compared to take a, an American and put them in Glasgow. Oh, Lord. Okay. Glasgow, Glaswegians, as they're called, or Glaswegians, have a really, really, really thick Scottish brogue. Uh, several years ago when my kids were much, much younger um, and uh, they were playing soccer with MSC Soccer, one of their coaches was a guy who was literally fresh off the boat from Glasgow. He's like 19 years old. He'd only been in the country for like two weeks. And it was like, slow down. <laughs> you know, speak more clearly. And after a while, you know, could understand him and such. Right? English dialects are much, much, much greater in their difference. Just from the west country of England to the southeast of England. Okay? Southeast, northeast. Southeast, northwest. It's the difference, for those of you who had um, the Britlet 1 course, it's the difference between Chaucer's, for example. Chaucer's Middle English, and if, um, if you've been in my class and you had the Broadview Anthology, and you try to read Sit Down in the Green Knight in the northwest dialect, you can't. You can't. It is so radically different. Well, it pretty much still is. It's not where you can't understand it, however, today. You can understand it. But the difference is much, much greater. Go anywhere in the United States, no matter where you're from, you can understand everybody else. You might need to slow it down a little bit. You might need to translate, so to speak, some words into your normal speak, you know, in the South, and you drink a sugary drink that has a lot of carbonation in it. What do you call it? But that's, that's what? It's a brand name. But if you're in the Northeast, what do you call it? Pop or soda. So there's three different ones. Okay. If you bring it, okay. That's true. Could be. 
Or Mountain Dew or yeah, Fanta, you know. For those of you who still know Fanta. Okay, so they're pretty much the same. The Linguistic Atlas of the United States and Canada, Laosak, begun in 1939 by Hans Karaf. Um, we get these um, definitions, not necessarily from this, but these are examples of what we're going to be talking about in a moment. So an isogloss. An isogloss is a boundary of a dialect feature. A dialect feature like the difference between soda, pop, and coke. Or, you know, the example I used the other day. How do you pronounce that? Is that s greasy or greasy? Because if it's a z and it's an s, you have a boundary there, okay? Dialect area, bundles of isoglosses. So when you get a whole bunch of these words that differentiate this area from this area, right? You've got a dialect area, right? Focal area. That's where you can narrow down, based upon all these words, to the center of that particular dialect area. I've mentioned before, J.R.R. Tolkien, in his edition of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, that's what he does with the dialect of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. He says, you can narrow down Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, the poems in its manuscript context, to a 20-mile uh, radius with the city of Chester at its center. So, 40 miles diameter, Chester at the center, okay, that is the focal area. That means there are some words that zero in right in the city of Chester, and then there are some that go farther out. Beyond that, you don't really see it. Okay? You can do the same thing with any work of Middle English literature. For the most part. Now, something like Chaucer, it's a little harder. But Chaucer is from Kent, and you can find the Kentish. Guess what? Same thing's been done with Shakespeare. We know Shakespeare was from Warwick, um, was from Stratford on Avon, right? But you can look at materials written in Warwickshire, which where Stratford is, right? And you can find in Shakespeare's plays and poems, Warwickshire-isms. That is, turns of speech, phrases, words that you don't find, for example, in Cheshire, or you don't find in Essex or Sussex. These are, quote-unquote, proofs that the guy from Stratford-on-Avon is the author of the plays. Okay? So here's an example of... Where is it? Of a dialect area. You know, I'm pretty sure. Um, no, we're not going to use that one. We'll use this one. Here. I don't remember if it comes after or before. Yeah, here it is. So you have here pretty much the southeast, and where you have a darkened circle that represents the usage of the word toe sack or toe bag, where you have an open circle, quite a few in Mississippi and Alabama, Georgia's relatively you know, spread out. You have crocus or croker sack, where you have a darkened triangle, a croker bag, and where you have a square, unfilled, grass sack or grass bag. And this is distribution of the use of toe sack, croker bag, croker sack, and grass sack as synonyms for, anybody know what these are synonyms for? Oh, Burlap know. bag. What? <laughs> I've never heard of these. It's, this is this is old, okay? This is from Hans Karath's dialect. Um, the thing I just mentioned, 19, begun in 1939, okay? So. But you're talking 2019, 
and not the 1940s and 1950s. So, Tosak, Tobac, where do you see those primary? Notice, pretty much all of Arkansas, northern Mississippi, northern Alabama, northern Georgia, and throughout Tennessee. Okay? So, where do you see most of the open circles? Deeper south. Notice Florida is not much, okay? But central Alabama, Mississippi's fairly widespread, and Georgia is fairly widespread, okay? Croker Bank. Two around Atlanta. There's one over kind of more toward the desk, I guess. Here's one down near Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I don't see many more than that, okay? Grass sack or grass bag? None in Mississippi. None in Alabama. None in Georgia that I see. None in Florida that I see. Down on the coast and some Texas. Yeah, couple in Tennessee, north central Tennessee, and like slightly northeast Tennessee. Yeah, couple, you know, down here in Texas, but predominantly Louisiana. I have Monday. Okay. And that would be that would be an indication of you know some kind of difference in emphasis. For example. Crocus and croaker, or croaker, that implies these are similar, obviously. Toe sack, toe, I, I have no idea what the toe, unless it's, you know, so heavy you tow it behind you, which, depending upon the size of the burlap bag, I mean, if you're talking about a 100-pound bag of feed, you might tow it behind you if you're not strong enough to carry it on your shoulders, etc. But I think crocus, and I think little white flower that comes up in the spring, I don't know what else that could refer to. Okay, so there's an example. So there's, you know, right there is a pretty good dialectal boundary. Okay, give you another one because we're talking about, yeah, some. Here's another one. Now I know you guys have heard of these. Oh, chiggers. You've never heard of a chitter? I'm not from here either. I'm from California. We used to talk about chiggers, and we didn't have them in California. Yeah, they bite you. And, yeah, okay. So chiggers and red bugs. Notice which is more descriptive. Red bug. It's a red bug. Okay. What's a chigger? Okay, so look at the dialect boundary. Pretty much northern half of northern, what, third of Georgia and Alabama, northern fourth of Mississippi, pretty much all of Arkansas, and all of Tennessee, except for one oddball, you know, over there, where is that? Somewhere around Shiloh, I guess. Okay, and then the rest of the deep south, except for. Now, what possible, what is a possible explanation, let's say, of New Orleans having chiggers as opposed to red bugs? The open yep. the river. New Orleans is a what more? It's more cosmopolitan. Even back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. It's okay. And probably the same with, notice, right here along the Gulf Coast. And there's a couple more there. I gotta tell you, I grew up in New Orleans. I don't think I have any more examples there. Okay. So, four major dialects. We've talked about these, and we're just about coming to an end of what we're discussing. So, the northern. 
Now notice, you know, in the northern New England, etc., North Midland, northern dialect comes from what? Essentially, here, let me put actually put this up. Down there at the bottom. Um, Two-thirds of original colonists were from southeast England. Well, where's where's northern? Kind of Mason-Dixon line north. Okay. Two-thirds of those come from southeast England. What's southeast England? London and the area south, slightly east of that. Okay. So London, Sussex, Kent, and Essex in, in the South East Anglia section, right? Who are the original colonists? Plymouth settlers, right? And those who came in the 17th century after. Southern, so the Southern, general Southern. So take, you know, this thing in generally that area. All right, so who's southern? 50% from southern England, especially the southwest. Where's southwest England? Gloucester, Cornwall, Devonshire, Somerset, that area. Okay, Cornwall and, and such. Midlands, go back to this. So you have... North Midlands, South Midland, put those two together. Midlands, northern portions of Great Britain, including Scotland. How do we know? How did, let's go back to this, how did the settlers, moving from primarily New England and the Virginia area, move into this area? What was that famous place they kind of went through? The something gap. The Cumberland. Cum. What is that? That's one of those old Celtic words. Where do those old Celtic words, you know, get retained in English? Scotland? Wales? Okay. Well, who settled that area? Who settled? Appalachia, not Appalachia, Appalachia. The Scots Irish. Why? Because it looks like Scotland. Appalachia looks like Scotland. Okay? So they come through, they come through Pennsylvania and what is now West Virginia, and they do the they, they do what? They come down here and they start to spread. They also spread down here, right? Because a lot of the deep south also has some pretty significant Scots-Irish influence, okay? And in the West, uh, excuse me, Midland from the, um, that's what we're talking about, Midland from the northern portions, from the West, development of Midland speech as it spread West through the Cumberland Gap, that is. It comes through here, and it does what? It just broadens out so that once you get past the Mississippi, Talk to somebody from South Dakota. Talk to somebody from Oklahoma. Not a lot of difference. Take that back. I have known some people from Oklahoma. Some Okies, majority there. Some Okies have really, really strong accents. Take somebody from South Dakota and somebody from Missouri. Notice how I just pronounced that latter state. Missouri. If you're from there, my mom was born... Northern Missouri, just south of the Iowa border, it's Missouri. Okay. Similarly, if you're from this state, how's it pronounced? Oregon, not Oregon, as some people pronounce it. This, Nevada, not Nevada. Listen to Mitt Romney. The guy doesn't know where he's from. He pronounces this Nevada. It's not Nevada, it's Nevada. Ah, ah, okay. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the general, okay. who also obviously settled here, particularly the state? 
Georgians, okay? Where'd they come from? Many of them. As with Australia. Criminals. I don't talk about that with my wife's family. Yeah. <laughs> Criminals and such, okay? Um, oh, yeah. The whole Botany Bay, I mean, the whole Star Trek Botany Bay and everything. Botany Bay was an actual British ship that brought prisoners to Australia, okay? Um, I think I've put this up before. So here you have, you know, a bit more of a breakdown. You've got these of dialects. And then, you know, this one has showed you some actual dialectal markers for each of the areas. And... Okay, we will stop with that stuff for the um, core stuff. Let's talk a little bit about the final, since I know this is what you're all interested in. <clears throat> Did I include something like this in your notes? At the, at the end of the British English uh, and American English and all that? Because I thought I had. Okay, so I didn't. Um, is that my eyes or is that just really out of focus? Does it get better if I make it bigger? Okay, so. Remember the exam will be comprehensive, but, huge but, most of it will be Renaissance forward. I just threw in the 80% today. It'll probably be more of that will be Renaissance forward. Okay. If we were to say, and we won't, if we were to say there were 100 questions, probably 10 to 15 would be from before the Renaissance. There won't be 100 questions. There'll be somewhere between, I don't know, 50 and 75, something like that. Okay. Um, probably some of you will be out of here in 20 minutes like you've been before. Um, you can read this stuff at the top. So, what do you need to review? Great vowel shift, right? Because that's during the Renaissance. Okay? So, review the great vowel shift. Me feet ox, so do ours. My feet ache, so do ours. Remember that mnemonic device and what it remembers? Okay? Possessives. Why is the apostrophe S wrong? Mars's sword. That kind of thing we've talked about. Okay. Um, SDH, this is old. I just merely dug it up this morning. And I don't know how much there will be about the STH verbing. But to you, thou pronoun, that's kind of interesting that, and significant. Okay. Um, so include that. But really, great vowel shift in this part is what's really important. Okay. Simplification, consonant clusters, and such. And those two major ideas, let's say, between enrichment and ascertainment. Be able to, for example, be able to not only define what enrichment means in terms of the Renaissance, but give examples. For example, what's the significance of Shakespeare for the idea of enrichment? Yeah. Or Thomas Eliot, you know? Some of those people that I have included in your notes. Okay. What's the significance of inkhorn terms? What's the significance of overseas terms? What's the significance of Chaucerisms? Why are those important? What do they signify for that idea of enrichment? Okay. Then go to the 18th century, restoration in the 18th century. Notice or note what is the restoration? What does that term refer to? Restoration of the Stuart monarchy, or just the monarchy, right? Um, and what does ascertainment imply? Remember, there are, there are several kind of aspects of ascertainment, right? So why is that important? What, what is the 18th century, what are the 18th century grammarians attempting to do to the language? And why? Be able to think of Swift, think of Dryden, Okay. Johnson, Johnson's dictionary, what he says in the preface about what he wanted to do, 
And what he realized when he got to the end of the dictionary, he couldn't do. Right? Some dates. Notice these all have asterisks by them. Why? These are ones you need to know. Okay, and I've got a couple more down here. And notice they don't all have asterisks. But the ones that do have asterisks, yeah, I would I would kind of you know drill those so that 20 years from now you're you know you still know it in your uh, damn dictionary. Okay. Yeah. Um, what else? 19th century developments. What are some of the differences between American and British English? Which one's more conservative? Which one's more archaic? Which one drops R's after a I can't search the web on Apple. <laughs> Ever since Steve Jobs died, Apple has just gone down. Um, um, yeah, dropping R's after vowels, post you know. So differences in standards, okay? Growth of national consciousness of American English, why? What are some of the people thinking to do? And, and bear in mind, all of this and all of those notes that you've had all semester long are based upon what? The book. So if you haven't cracked the book, <laughs> if you haven't bought the book, one is probably too late. They probably don't have them in the bookstore anymore, uh, in which case you're screwed. Um, but if you haven't read the chapters between now and next Tuesday, yeah, I've got it here somewhere, uh, would be a good time to, to probably do that because the notes are kind of summaries of what's in the book, okay? So that's, that's the majority. Okay? For the rest of it, somewhere between 10 and 20%, and extra credit possibly. Uh, and the extra credit will probably be somewhere between, I'd say minimum 30 points, maximum 50. Possibly. At least 30. Might not be any more, won't be any less. Okay? Know the basic terminology. Okay? Be able to describe consonants and that kind of stuff. What else? Indo-European language chart. Divisions of the language. <coughs> Seven traits of Germanic languages would be important to know. Okay, Grimm's Law. Doesn't mean you need to be able to do Grimm's Law. Know what it is. Know what it tells us. Okay? Um... No, I'm not. That's not going to show up on, on the exam. Um, what does it describe? Okay. Um, what else? Did I get the bottom. Yeah. So what else? Uh, historical linguistic background, Anglo-Saxon period, Middle English period. Notice here are some important dates for the Anglo-Saxon period. A.D. 449. What happened? Anyway, a couple of you draw papers on this. You shouldn't. Germanic invasions, okay? According to B, that's when the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes come in. 597, Roman Christianization, okay? St. Augustine comes from, it's sent by Pope Gregory the Great. 787, one or two of you wrote about this. Viking invasions. You didn't write about that. It should be the people who wrote about it. Okay, 878, King Alfred the Great. Okay, why is that date important? It's when he defeated the Danes. He stopped the Viking invasions. Okay, if he hadn't, we could do one of those, you know, wonderful little thought experiments. What would have happened if, if Alfred had been defeated? What would we be speaking? Possibly not English. Possibly it would be kind of like a mix of modern German and modern Icelandic. It'd be something more like that, because modern Icelandic is what Viking essentially developed into. Modern Icelandic and Norwegian, right? 
Um, so you sound kind of like the beaker on uh, the old Muppets, you know. Yeah, okay. So these dates, know the names associated, grammar. Nouns, verbs, adjectives are all what? Weak or strong? Okay. If it's an adjective, how do you know it's weak in Old English? It requires an article before it. If a verb is weak, what does that do for it in past tense? It has a dental suffix. If a verb is strong, how do you know the past tense? What happens to it? That word ablaut, which indicates a vowel change. Swim, swam, swung. Be able to give examples. Okay? Yeah, this is being... Lights on, yes. <laughs> Whether or not it's synced, I have no idea, because it's been doing some weird stuff lately. Okay? Review some of the foreign borrowings of the period, etc. Be able to explain, maybe a little bit. Uh, influence of Latin, Celtic, Old Norse. Okay. Middle English. Notice I've got two dates with asterisks. 1066. Go back earlier. What happens in January? Edward the Confessor dies. Harold Godwinson is crowned king the next day. Then William hears about it. The whole you know thing goes to hell. And that's September twenty fifth. It's not on there, but Battle of Stamford Bridge. Okay, October fourteenth. Battle of Hastings, or as one of you I'm sure will put down, Battle of Battle. Okay, Christmas Day, ten sixty six. William's crowned king. Okay, so importance of each of these. Stamford Bridge, notice is there. King John, why is King John important? Well, the date that I don't have asterisk, he loses Normandy. Okay, pretty important. Henry the scrap off Henry the Third. Henry V, Bosworth Field, which is fourteen eighty five. What happens at Bosworth Field? A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Richard III says in Shakespeare's great play, when Henry VII defeats him, and Henry Tudor defeats him, and becomes Henry VII, right? Starting the Tudor monarchy, succeeded by his son, Henry VIII. Mary, you know, etc. right? So, gradual restoration of English and the demise of French. What's the significance of the year 1250? What happens? What is happening before then? And then what is happening after then? Prior to 1250, who's ruling? The French. The French, and what are they doing? They're speaking French. Who's learning French? The English. The English are. And what are they doing while they learn French? They're borrowing French words into their native vocabulary. After 1250, what's happening? The French are learning English. The very fact that they are learning English tells us what? English is one. And they are borrowing French into English as they are learning English. Okay? In both instances, they're borrowing French into the language. But the French are borrowing French into English because... They are now supplying okay, words that the English don't have and such, but it's telling us they've already they've already realized they have to learn English. Okay? The English have to learn French before in order to get along, prosper, etc. Okay? Um, and then lastly, you know, you've got that nice handy little 10-point summary of the major changes from Old English to Middle English. That 10 point summary includes things like what? Well, you've got all those spelling changes. Okay? And the spelling changes are indicating really what? Pronunciation changes. Because French can't begin a word with what sound, after all? <sighs> so, hual, what, become wal, what, w h instead of h w, for example. 
they hear that word Kinicht. And what do they do? Because this Monty Python thing, if you're not familiar with it, watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail between now and then. <laughs> Niggas. Because they hear that and got to make a hard good sound in there. So you get that spell, okay? All that stuff's explained, you know, in the notes and even more so in the book. Questions? Answers? Prayers? <laughs> Friends, Romans, temperament? <laughs> All right. Yeah, the exam is the 30th from 8 to 10 o'clock. That is one week from today. Today, by the way, is what day? It's April 23rd. Oh, it's Shakespeare's, it's Shakespeare's birthday. birthday and death day. Oh, that's weird. All right, that is all. Eight to ten a.m. Those of you who have done the um, Old and Middle English extra credit, I will hand something back to you next week. I may hand back papers next week. After you take the exam, I don't want to, you know, blow anybody's mind before. Um, I haven't even started looking at yours, so I've done my other class first. <laughs>